Welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. It is July 31st, 2013, and we are gathered here to talk about blogging and evaluating blogs and all things Dakota Writing Project Digital digital uh, Sandbox. How, how, how's that for an introduction? Anyway, <laughs> yep. so whatever comes up, let's put it that way, and I think other people will be joining us as we talk, but um, we thought we'd get started. Um, Michelle, uh, yeah. do you want to introduce the folks here tonight and um, introduce yourself first, if you don't mind? Okay. And then we'll, we'll I, I want to get a little history of uh, the sandbox, if we could okay. start that way. And then we'll get into your questions. Okay. I'm, I'm actually going to ask Good. people to introduce themselves. No, that's if, fine. Yeah. If I in <laughs> Which I just I, did for you. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, so, yeah. I'm Valerie. So. So. Okay. Michelle, go ahead. Um, I'm Michelle Rogie Gannon. I direct the Dakota Writing Project and teach uh, English courses at the University of South Dakota. I also direct the Writing Center at USD. And we've been doing some version of the Digital Writing Sandbox for a number of years. I wish I was wishing that we had Lindsay Sorensen here with us tonight because she um, did wrote up a little history of the. Uh, what was the digital writing sand, uh, sandbox marathon, digital writing marathon, uh, electronic writing marathon, which actually I believe started back in, I want to say 2004 maybe, um, when Karen McComas and I um, teamed up. I, I uh, remember Karen, seeing you guys across there kind of planning things. So yeah, 2003 or four, something like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you've got a good decade on you here. Yes. Yeah. And so it's it, evolved over time. So can you speak to that a little bit? How's it evolved? Um, we started out in a moo, and you know, and that just really seems archaic now, doesn't it? Um, no, I, you know, maybe <laughs> moos have become moots. I don't know. Never mind. It's a bad joke. But, yes. But go ahead. And for me, I thought part of the charm of a moo was that it was text-based that you had to write something. You had to, you know, to write words uh, that appeared on the screen and you could manipulate words in a certain way. Um, you could, through words, create your space that people mm -hmm. would be looking at and then they had to imagine what it looked like from the words you wrote. Um, that you could have bots or characters that would say certain phrases that you had programmed into the, the character. Um, so we played with some of that. Um, you know, in terms of how we set up the electronic writing marathon back then. And um, that eventually, uh, we eventually, you know, moved out of that space, um, out of the moo, uh, just just because it did start to feel a little bit archaic. Would you say that's true, Anne? Um, I don't remember the moo. I remember tapped in. You remember tapped in, which was right. really like a moo. It's so amazing. We're just talking about a decade, right? So, yes. But yeah, it's so interesting how things come and go. But yeah, but but you know, I mean, what seems play seems like it was a, a note that you struck early on, and since yeah. you're still calling it a sandbox, that sounds like yeah an important element. So. Yeah, play has always been really important in the uh, digital writing sandbox and in all its versions. Um, the idea that we got to play with a form of technology, uh, that it didn't have to be all that serious, and we could um, experiment, make you know mistakes, quote unquote, and um, be free to share our ideas and reactions to what we were experiencing. Even if something failed, we could talk about why it failed, um, what we could learn from it, um, and I think that was part of the beauty of that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when we moved into tapped in, it still had a moo. It was a, still a moo-like experience, right? It had many elements of a traditional moo, but it was more visual, and uh, we liked that space. It was a really great space. Uh, but again, you know, we decide. You know, we'd made certain decisions uh, when NWP Connect came about to make some changes. And so we had started using a combination of NWB Connect and the 
uh, a tat, uh, chat space that we have, which it's a text-based chat space, which might seem <laughs> archaic to some, but um, from some of the postings I've been seeing from people where they reflect on the the chat the day, you know, day or two after, um, that chat has been a valuable process. We follow a protocol, which everybody gets to share, and that seems to work pretty well, and it's one that's evolved over time. So, I, we want to hear more. Um, I do. Yeah. But let's yeah. let's get some other voices in here. And yes. So maybe some more introductions. Um, Anne, do you want to introduce yourself? Can we do that? Sure. Um, Anne Beggy. Uh, I teach seventh grade language arts at Mitchell Middle School in Mitchell, South Dakota, and I began facilitate. I was one of the people who uh, from our Dakota Writing Project who took the first couple of um, electronic writing marathons, which then became the Sandbox, and I've been a facilitator now uh, for I think this is the third or third year, third summer that I've helped facilitate uh, cool. the Sandbox. So, great. Welcome. Thank you, um, Jennifer. Quick introduction. Okay, I'm Jennifer Harvey from Columbus, Ohio. Participated in the Capital Area Writing Project here a couple years ago and uh, did some advanced digital writing workshops at The Ohio State University. I teach 7th and 8th grade humanities, which is the integrated um, English language arts and social studies in Columbus City Schools at Indianola Informal. That your 7th grade also? Is that right? Yes, 7th okay. and 8th grade. Mm -hmm. okay. A, a converted elementary teacher, and I won't go back. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> <laughs> Onward and upward. <laughs> so there. I, I something I've said on the show for a couple times, so I don't want to bore people. But I'm moving from working with 18, 19, 21 year olds to um, to sixth and seventh graders this year. Mm -hmm. So that oh boy. So you guys, I need you. All right. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk. Um, Samantha, can you join us? Are you there already? Welcome. Um, We're doing introductions, so you came just oh, at a good time. We can hear you okay. fine. Yeah, you can ahead. hear me? Yep. All right, good deal. So you're introducing yourself? Oh, Hello. yep. Sammy Peel, <laughs> nice sorry. I'm from, um, I teach at Dubrook. I teach high school English in South Dakota. Very cool. She's one of our assistant facilitators in the sandbox as well. Steve, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, Steve. You'll get that mic on. Go ahead. <laughs> right, wasn't ready. While he's working on that, Valerie, do you want to say hello? Hi, Valerie Burton from New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, I worked with the Greater New Orleans Writing Project and found these Dakota guys online, and I'm <laughs> loving this experience. Very cool. Steve, I think we can hear you now. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, my name is Steve Gores. I'm in Madison, South Dakota. I've, uh, I'm making a transition to 8th uh, um, grade English language arts and 8th grade American history. The last two years I've been in a 6th grade self-contained classroom. Um, mm -hmm. I've been in and out of education the last 15 years, um, but I, I'm, I realized I'm going to stop running and just uh, embrace it. And, and, uh, and uh, I, I, I've always enjoyed working with junior high, um, the 6th, 7th, and 8th grade, and so I don't know if I'm glutton for punishment or uh, I just don't want to grow up. I don't know. <laughs> and so I, I actually, through Common Core training, stumbled on this uh, the, in, during a presentation a year ago, and then now just got an email uh, recently. Uh, I don't know when that was, May, I think, and signed up and was just wanted to come along for the ride. So, Great. Well, thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, can, Michelle, can you say a little more about um, numbers and um, how it works and, you know, just some of the logistics a little bit, maybe? Okay. And then, and then, but, but also, <laughs> sorry, the, one of the reasons we thought to get together was because some people had some questions, ideas, thoughts about evaluating, looking at, thinking about how to scaffold blogging online. 
So yeah. that might be an issue that we'll get to pretty quickly. I just so stay tuned. Right. We'll get there. <laughs> right, right. Mm -hmm. um, we got a seed grant from you know through the National Writing Project that helped to fund um, the Digital Writing Sandbox, and um, we had a planning team that really you know we figured out. I mean, sometimes for us the biggest agony is what technologies. What technology environments are we going to use? And we don't want to seem like we're duplicating, you know, at the same kind of technology. And, and so we will have discussions about that. That's always kind of a, a bit of a debate. But we always felt it was more, you know, more important than being cutting edge with technology was to be deliberate in how we use the technology in the classroom that that's where a lot of the innovation or creativity might come in more than with the specific technology, more with how we used it in the classroom. And that really emerges from the conversations that we would have with the, the teachers. And the, the structure of it is such that it's there are two legs to it. Um, the first leg in the summer, um, five weeks. Um, each week, um, the teachers are given a tutorial, if you will, which they will follow. They explore particularly a uh, particular technology environment um, or technology. This week we did digital storytelling and then of course we did weblogs. We did um, uh, Edmodo. And, um, and then they would come online on Monday nights for a live chat to discuss what their experience was like with that particular form of technology. And we would go around and share, and there's also a sort of a brainstorming that happens. It's, um, you know, that comes from that live chat experience, that back and forth conversation. People are just just start spilling out ideas about ways in which they might use the technology um, in the classroom, and it's to me that's part of the beauty of the that text-based chat and the conversation that happens. Um, and you know, for those who have to miss part of the chat, or um, or for whatever reason can't be there that night, they're able to look at the transcript afterwards, and just like the others, write a uh, reflection about what they you know what they read in the transcript and add their voices to it. So we think it's been a you know pretty good process. And so they explore those technology environments, and then you know for uh, three Michelle, weeks. Can, yeah. Can I can, can I ask you a little to break? out that word and others can jump in here too. Um, yeah. When you say explore a technology, what's that look like? I mean, yeah. do you play with it? I mean, do you have an inquiry that you're going across all the technologies or do you just mess around? Or <laughs> Would some of the rest of you like to jump in there and say What's explore a technology look like? <laughs> Um, oftentimes it involves. Uh, somebody trying this to is, talk? No. Yeah, this is Anne talking. Good. Hopefully. <laughs> By the way, some of this, some people will hear this. On, sorry. Yeah, Anne, you're there. I, I just, um, it's great to say your name once in a while because some people will be listening to this as a podcast. Just to say. Okay. But go ahead, Anne. Yeah. Okay. Um, when we construct the the tutorials, of course, part of it is getting familiar with the space, you know, creating an account and just pointing out. But the other things, for example, um, the facilitators, we split up the duties of um, building the tech, uh, the tutorials. So my job was to build the blogging tutorial. So some of the things that I put together would be how would you possibly use a blog within your classroom, um, you know, just from making a post to um, you know, doing like a reader's response with a blog post. Um, how might you use photos or images with a blog post? Mm -hmm. So um, I have to say, this particular group—it's not just you, by the way, folks. Um, Anne is highly in advanced <laughs> in many uh -huh. cases. So some of them had already blogged for two process events. Oh, sorry. Um, I was just going to say. Go ahead. Uh, for those it's who aren't ex haven't been ex ex okay, for those who haven't been exposed to a blog, uh, it gives them a little bit of an, uh, some background and foundation before they actually um, do some more exploring on their own. 
so we looked at kid blog and um, blogger both. And that led to the discussion. Um, and then somebody, and I think it was a post post chat reflection, asked or wondered about how to how to work with the digital writing really. I mean, it's that's what it really comes down to. How do you how as a teacher do you respond to this digital writing? How do you evaluate it? Um, and I thought, you know, that's why I turned to you, Paul, because I, I knew you had expertise in this area. That's why I sent you that email. Yeah, yeah, and I'm happy to talk about it. What, what were some of the other answers that people came up with in your talk, though? I mean, there were, there were some advanced bloggers or people who had used blogging in their classroom already. Um, um, yes, in my chat group, there were several that had already blogged, mm -hmm. um, and there were some that wondered about uh, evaluating and uh, so obviously a rubric, uh, we did discuss a rub just basic rubrics briefly but there was also the discussion of how about throwing the rubric out for the sake of creativity and letting the kids you know really take ownership for what they're writing so we kinda we talked about both sides I think mm -hmm. Anybody else want to contribute thoughts about blogging and this question? Well, it certainly seems as if you could ask the kids to help develop a rubric. Mm -hmm. Have them take ownership over that. Right. And I won't be so coy. I mean, I'll j I'll jump in with with, with okay. some thoughts, and then we'll see okay. if other people have some ideas. Um, I don't coy. I don't know if that's right. Word. Sorry, <laughs> but but certainly um, on youth voices, commenting yeah. I think is the heart of the work we do there. Yeah. Um, so, pu publishing having kids be self publishers. In other words, uh, you know, it doesn't go through a teacher first. Is really an essential part of what what we do. Um, but so that's one on one hand. Um, on the other hand, um, guiding them and encouraging and and making suggestions for how to make comments on the site is has been something that we've learned makes well. You know, I mean, as as we know in writing projects, you know, the kind of listening that happens in groups and and writing groups and so forth. Um, creates a space for, for people to write into. So if you know you're going to get that kind of response, that, that's what it's all about. Um, having said that, a few, a few teachers who use Youth Voices do respond to kids, but mostly we stay out of there. So that's one question that's interesting. Like, do teachers respond to kids' blog posts? I don't. Um, and, you know, because I, I want it to be a youth space in some way. So there's there's some things to maybe push back or think about. But but um, on the other hand, we, we guide very carefully with these kind of fill-in-the-blank <laughs> guides almost. Um, I saw with, those. With how kids, how kids might respond. Yeah. Go ahead, Michelle. You were wanting to interrupt me. Please do. <laughs> <laughs> Please do. <laughs> yeah, I saw those, um, those examples that you had kind of fill-in-the-blank, but do they rigidly follow those or do they... At first, we asked them to, um, and um, and the the best way to understand them is to try it, um, you know. And and what what you what most people say is that even though it's rigid, it it made me like pay more attention to the reading that I was doing, you know. They're 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 really just based on Peter Elbow's notion of pointing. So we ask kids to point at two things that um, stand out to them. Um, and then um, ha have a conversational response toward the end, and then um, try to make some connection or give reason if you do agree, disagree, kind of in the middle. So they're 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 filling the blank, sort of. But but that's not really fair. They're really kind of rhetorical moves that we're suggesting that kids can take. Um, gotcha. And and we found we found that you know. Rather than trying to give a um, an assignment like that, 
it's just quicker to say, okay, this is what it looks like. <laughs> right? But then, yes, of course, people can move off and, and play around around that as much as they want to. So they can depart from that structure if they need to. Yeah, right. So Keeping in mind what, what yeah. the structure intends, right? Right. Yeah. right. But, but it, gets, it gets way beyond that, you know, great, great post, you know, um, mm -hmm. or, or this one sucks, or do you know you misspelled <laughs> the third word in the fourth credit? <laughs> <laughs> that kind of stuff. Um, so, and, and I think it's really important to get beyond that, you know, so that, so the kids are responding to each other's content. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, How do you mm -hmm. get them to take so much initiative in terms of you? You said something at the start of this when you were talking about um, youth voices, the self publishing, I think you mm -hmm. said. How do you get them? Yeah, we always forget that. that. <laughs> what do you mean? How do um, initiate it. You, you said you want them to take ownership over that p initial process, I think, was yeah. how you put it. The when they're publishing entries or posting? Yeah, I mean, there's a whole, there's a whole piece of, of this that's about, um, and I'm supposed to be interviewing you guys, but uh, so <laughs> keep interrupting. <laughs> but there, there's a whole piece of um, where, where students, we develop from interest-based inquiries, um, and, and, um, and students do a lot of writing in, in various ways before they actually publish, you know. Um, Right. You're probably familiar with a lot of that, but um, and we're on this. The teachers who are administrators on the site are on the site all the time, kind of looking in and and making sure things are cool. But gotcha. but there, it, it's not like. But but I've found that any any of the processes that teachers had to approve things before they get published were too slow. Like kids uh -huh. publish much faster than than we can ever keep up with. <laughs> um, so, and we want that, you know, we, we yeah. want them writing and, and responding to each other more than we can handle. <laughs> but, yeah. So folks, do, um, do you have any questions or comments on that, what he's describing, that process? Can you imagine doing that with your students or have you? Uh, well, this is Jennifer, and over the summer, um, I started a blog for their summer reading, um, both, well, just my incoming eighth grader, so kids I had as seventh graders, and I am not doing anything with the site other than looking at it and uh, expecting them to learn how to interact with each other, um, how to present their information um, in a, well, to present their information in clear, concise formats and to respectfully comment on each other and it wasn't a mandatory thing kind of like this tonight <laughs> so there's been a little bit of activity it's been really kind of interesting as helping me guide what I'm actually going to do with it um, during the school year but I definitely like Paul's idea of it's the kids space um, because I do want them to take ownership of it and I want them to uh, work at the craft of writing and in this um, blogging format to understand um, the different communication skills that they need to um, come forth with and that they're doing more peer editing because that's what I've always had a tr uh, trouble with in class is I'm not getting that good peer editing so I figured if I let them loose on this site that maybe it will be something that will develop for them because it's something more that they're interested in as opposed to something that I'm mandating that they do. So. And are they, um are they writing, and they're writing about the same book or a different book? No, just whatever, whatever books um, they're reading. Um, they had one mandatory read, which I told them they could, or they, they didn't have to talk about. I actually preferred that they didn't because we were going to use that for the first couple of weeks of school. But if they wanted to, that was fine. So it, I put it out kind of as a challenge. Let's see who can read the most books and the most diverse books and I actually even put some teacher challenges out there for some books that I was interested in having them read where they could get more points for those books and they were supposed to talk about their um, their uh, interactions with the text and you know what really jumped out at them and then to communicate that to their classmates and then for the conversations to ensue so a little bit of activity has been going on, and like I said, it's now it's more of me figuring out 
how can I use this during the school year and will will be effective for you know to develop those communication skills in a you know digital format. So we'll see. <laughs> so are you are you assessing or evaluating or giving no. points for? They're getting points for because they're they're going to earn. Uh, they can win some gift cards to like half price books. So that's the only thing. There's no assessment other than, you know, how many books have you read, and you get more points if you read a teacher challenge book, which mm -hmm. there's only been two out there all summer, and I have I'm not putting any. Uh, we start in three weeks, so what? I'm done. <laughs> so it's like I have to get my curriculum together. What what were those teacher challenge books? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Um, I'm kind of embarrassed, but no. Um, you know what? I, the one was Jefferson Sons. Um, that's for mm -hmm. because we do eighth grade um, in American history, which I think Steve said that that's what he works with as well. Mm -hmm. um, not the greatest book, but it's an interesting concept, and it's something we we talk about the multiple perspectives of the the time periods and how. Um, that we currently have multiple perspectives, so we shouldn't think that there weren't multiple perspectives all along our historical timeline. So uh, we're looking at uh, different people's points of view. So looking at um, Sally Hemings' children is what Jefferson's son's all about, and how they were making plans for them to you know move past the plantation. So that was a, a challenge book, and what was the other one? That was the first one, and I put up a second one, and I can't for the life of me think. I'll have to go look. That's okay. The first one so, was pretty intense. <laughs> so, yeah, it was, a, it, so, it was an interesting read. So you're asking, how can I take this experience back to the classroom in the fall? Yeah, I'm just... I'm, I'm, You've never blogged in the... In the well, we have, or, but, yeah. but in, you know, in, in different manners. So I really want it to be, like you said, more of a, a student venue. It's not something I necessarily... I'm looking to um, looking to uh, evaluate. Now I'm going to use blogs in different ways, which they are going to get evaluated because we're looking at it with so uh, the Socratic seminars, maybe some um, pre-writing prior to the <coughs> seminar, and then reflection writing after the seminar, which will be a little more, you know, um, mm -hmm. regimented, and there will be an assessment. But it's, um, our school is very focused on. Um, uh, independent reading and and developing their you know their reading so uh, we don't have a lot of time in the way we're formatting our class we used to be all self-contained classrooms sixth seventh and eighth grade um, but now we've gone to more um, departmentalized so it's harder to give the kids the time to do their independent reading and get the reflection so I had to, we had to come up with some more uh, innovative ways, and you know, what better way than to do something that they're used to, and being on an in, uh, online environment. So, mm -hmm. I hope that was uh, that explained that. <laughs> Couple technical questions. So, uh -huh. so, are are you using one class blog, and do they have their own space, or how are you arranging that? Um, I'm using Edge Blogs. Uh -huh. So I have okay. my I have my teacher account, and then they each have their individual space. So there's mm -hmm. certain things that they have to um, respond to on MySpace, but then they have their own spaces where other kids are expected to go. So. And public or not public or? Not public. Not, not public. public. Not at this time until we can. I can make mm -hmm. sure that um, they're doing what they need to be doing and they understand <laughs> the ramifications well, yeah. of not. And everybody makes their own decisions on that. Just to put it out there, though, you know, yeah. Youth Voices has been about for 10 years um, public. So everything everyone puts out right away is right out there on the street. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so, that's where I would but, like yeah. to. I would like to get to that. Uh -huh. Just not there yet. <laughs> cool. Do you well, have Do you have what, students sign an agreement to, you know, yes, not bully other students or? I yes. Yes. And actually, the parents have to do it too. They oh. have to sign the agreement, the same agreement that the students do. So it's all, you know, the, all the um, netiquette and, gotcha. you know, I had some parents be a, a, were a little bit upset with them, with me about having to sign it themselves, but <laughs> we've had some issues. <laughs> so. On the blog or in life? No, previously we've, you know, not through school. But it mm -hmm. comes back to school on some of the um, you know, a lot of Facebook issues with parents getting into kid conflict and having words with children. So 
Mm. It just, you know, made sense that they need to understand these are the rules for the 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 classroom and, and the educational environment that we're creating online. So cool. thanks for sharing it. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Valerie, you've done some blogging, haven't you? Or um, uh, yeah. What are you thinking? I, I have. Where you've been and where you want to go and what have these people from these your friends from Dakota taught you? Um, they've <laughs> reminded me to go full circle again and to start from the beginning. So the beginning for me was Edmodo and I'd left Edmodo alone and moved on to other things. But Edmodo is a good way to get the peer editing part in, meaning everybody's got an assignment, this is what the assignment is, and post it in Edmodo, um, everybody else's assignment, is to comment on two or three posts or whatever to provide your classmate with some assistance before your classmate publishes to the World Wide Web. So once they have discussions and do some revising about the piece in Edmodo, we then take that finished piece and publish it either to my class blog or their personal blog. So I want to do Edmodo to do some of the inside writing, so to speak, where they have an opportunity to think it out and to hammer it out and to clean it up. And then once they've had that opportunity to do the revising or whatever, then they publish it to the world. And I, I want them to, to focus on responding to the, um, the class blog and on their own personal blogs as well. I love mm -hmm. So. Cool. I, yeah, you know, I'm, you're going to get some pushback from me on some of that, but. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> no, just because, just because, I, I, I think it's, I, I mean, I don't know, like, why so much time, it's so, so Here's here's what I was thinking when you were saying it. The kids who struggle the most need the most social right. interaction, right? Um, and so it takes them so long to get published, often that the class has moved on. <laughs> I I find you know, and so so I struggle with that. Like, how do you get kids up so that they're proud of their work enough that they're not embarrassed by it? You know, that it's good enough, um, and that they're getting feedback and comments about the work from their peers. Um, but, you know, so, so it can't be perfect to get up. Not you're, not that you're saying it's perfect. I, I didn't hear that. But, right. But I think those are issues. But. Well, for my kids, um, uh, my experience, even with Youth Voices, was they really did not believe anybody else was going to read it. They really didn't. So they really didn't put necessarily their first foot forward. Um, so what wound up happening even with the poems that the girl posted that was responded to by you know another student, even as she read it the next day, it was like, oh man, I misspelled this word, this word, and this word. Where she was doing the assignment because I gave it to her. Mm -hmm. She knew she had a deadline. She published it, but she didn't really stop to take the extra five minutes to look at it again for the mm -hmm. simple spelling errors that another classmate might have caught. But she could still fix those. She could, yeah. but you know, my whole thing, and I want, because I've got, we've got 90 minutes. Mm -hmm. And within 90 minutes, you have an opportunity, if you created your piece at home, you have an opportunity to put it up there, discuss it in class a little bit, fine-tune it, and still publish it before, you know, the bell rings uh, to the world. Um, I just want them to have that final piece where if I am publishing it, I want it to be the best. I want it. I want to put more of an effort into it than I did the Facebook post that I just threw up on my way to classroom and hit publish. You know, I want to create it. I want to look at it. I want another set of eyes to look at it, 
and then you know put it out there. Other thoughts? Um, how about Steve? Have you done any blogging or wanted to do blogging or Samantha else? Um, we, uh, I haven't really done a lot of blogging as a, from a teacher standpoint, um, mm -hmm. but with my class, yeah. I did do some Edmodo, um, and and the students tried to interact through that, um, but um, as we noticed too when we used it, there wasn't a lot of the the, the the responding to a post isn't um, really conducive for a lot of interaction. Um, and then we also, and I'm no, I say, say a little more. What, what happened? What? Well, um, and I, you know, part of that could have been at first me with with clicking the right button to make them be able to see each other's posts. And, um, but I know with our in the digital sandbox, what we found was um, it, it was difficult. To, if we responded, it, it uh, we couldn't or we couldn't respond to a, a response to reply to a response, um, and it wasn't threaded like we had envisioned it would be. Um, mm -hmm. And so, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. And then I, I'm trying to think of what uh, a couple years ago a class uh, we did. Um, it was gaming and education, and I was I forget the name of it. Um, I think it was the same company that Brain Pop came out with. Um, it, it was game-based learning, more mathematics and solve, you know, problem solving. And but within that, there was a they could interact with each other. And uh, it just dawned on me listening to your conversations how, and that was stuff I, you know, those are conversations I I could see, but are happening in real time, and how much they, you know, tried to learn from each other. If somebody had solved a certain level or went in a certain door, and so it's just kind of. As I'm, uh, you know, I was trying to kind of sneak in and just be incognito and lay back and listen, um, <laughs> and uh, but but I've noticed how or find that, you know, I think as a teacher, I too, I I think I try to control too, you know, so much and want to, I don't know, but I need to. I'm learning that it's probably more successful, and as we found and blog and write to just. Um, Kind of let go and let the students have that and, and interact in that way with with guidance and those types of things. But um, mm -hmm. so that's those are my experiences. Um, but I would really really like to bring more um, with the, with the exposure to. Would like to 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 start using blogging, um, especially with having language arts and American history and being able to bring those together um, this year. What, so what do you imagine you might do? Um, you know, as I, um, I really, uh, I've, uh, my first vision, first thinking is is with uh, just different summaries or different maybe P articles or um, in the history part to have read and respond. Mm -hmm. um, but that's why I was too hoping to get some some more I some I some ideas with how to do that or what to do. Um, and now that we, we're sitting down and actually kind of uh, doing the lesson plan part, since it's all brand new, I, I'm thinking i got to dive in and get my uh, hands dirty and try to figure it out, probably scrape my knee a couple times, and then uh, hope, you know, hopefully I can figure out the direction before that. But Steve, you're in a sandbox. You won't get hurt that bad. But 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 thanks for sharing some of those doubts and questions and that's interesting. Did you say it's global history or did you? Um, it's American history. It's American history. Yeah. Right. So just and I think from you know uh, just before colonization through Reconstruction. Oh, just a few years. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. And is that all year for the eighth grade? Yes. Okay. Yes. So and and what's your uh, I'm I, I'm just like having this dialogue in my or wanting to repeat the dialogue that I've had this summer with um, history teachers runs. So uh, do you approach chronologically or do you approach thematically or how do you think about that? Um, this being my first year and I uh, it knew with the, the content getting know it and I have I have two sections another teacher has two sections. Um, and you got to stay together more or less, or I, yeah, I believe so. Yeah. And, and and from first conversation, seems that um, 
chronological following the book um, and how that is laid out. And so the history um, book. You mean? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, but what I'm excited about also in thinking more is that I have all the st all the students for English language arts. So I'm hoping to to maybe go you know beyond textbook or tangents with that within the language arts class um, and maybe focusing on concepts throughout American history that way. Mm -hmm. So let me just offer um, one, one thought and you know I don't have the pressure of working with a colleague to stay next to him. I mean all these all these kinds of uh, issues that teachers deal with are really important to deal with. But um, this summer when we started with young people around 10 self and 10 world questions, right? And just way open that way. Um, and then develop themes out of that, that that came out of their own passions, their own interests. Um, we, a history teacher thought about whether or not, she was actually a global history teacher, whether or not she could teach thematically or chronologically, right? Um, and chronologically was the way she is teaching. But somebody pointed out, you know, there's a group over there that wants to deal with peace and justice issues. Like, isn't that a global history yeah. issue that goes across different right, um, eras? And there's a group over there that's dealing with, you know, um, other, other issues that, that could connect to history. So it just, anyway, it just seemed to us at the time that a thematic approach would fit a starting with your own interest in the English class in, in some way better. Oh, but I totally yeah. understand the issues around coverage and staying together and all of that. But any thoughts about any of that? <laughs> yeah, and I um, and you're kind of cutting in and out a little bit, but oh, I I'm sorry. Kind of caught the gist of, of most of that, and that's um, that's what I am envisioning with that is is within the American history class, following more of the chronological, but within the language arts, you're pulling more. Themes out and getting more of the, the self writing and the and the mm -hmm. um, the the community or I forget the last frame of, of uh, the social uh, action writing. Anybody else want to jump on this theme or another one? I wondered about um, Steve since I know you're a South Dakota teacher. Um, are you address how you're addressing um, American Indian? Um, history, you know, the, that aspect of our history, um, how you bring that into uh, the classroom. Um, you cut out was a question about American Indian. Indian history, how you bring that into the classroom. Um, you know, that's a great question. Um, I'm not, I hadn't. Steve, we're, we'll, we'll just add a few more here before we're done. Okay. <laughs> you can address that. Yeah, I, I forgot my. Did you say this is taped so I can go back and watch it? And yes. Make sure I'm <laughs> um, uh, then that's that's a. Uh, I'm not sure how I'm going to do that or how they've done it uh, too. I haven't had that meeting to see if it has and and kind of believing that maybe uh, there isn't isn't as much of that as one would think. Um, but I personally find the Native American history and culture very very interesting. So. Um, that would, you know, that's another area that I could hopefully weave into the language arts uh, area also with, within the having all the students. And so I'm not, you know, trying to throw things off or whatever. Michelle, tell, tell us more what, you're, what you think about that in terms of coming from South Dakota. It is South, yes. Um, well, we, you know, we had the... Um, Dakota Writing Project did the Holocaust Institute for a few years and we combined um, the Holocaust and um, Native American genocide and which um, and it was amazing to see how many connections could be made between what had happened to and has continuing to happen to American Indians um, in the United States and um, to the uh, the Jews during the the Holocaust and um, you know it, by the end of the institute we found that teachers were more comfortable thinking about teaching those issues because they are very volatile still in South Dakota and we have nine 
uh, some of them admittedly very small reservations, uh, but other we have a couple, you know, we do have 10% uh, of our population is Native American. Mm -hmm. And I think it's probably been neglected. So I was wondering, you know, how much, you know, how you could work with blogging or digital writing and, and writing about some of those issues, those types of issues. And as you were talking, I was wondering how um, the Holocaust project that you were describing yeah. makes connections between personal issues and and these, you know, important historical issues. Do they? I, I imagine. Because um, I think that's the yeah. answer to your question. I think blogging starts in a personal place and then moves out toward yeah. um, those other issues. Yeah, we had um, identity as our theme, sort of our overall theme, and um, something that we had borrowed from um, uh, the Holocaust Educators Network, um, the seminar that they do in, in New York City, we had borrowed uh, the idea of the identity box and creating identity boxes, and what we would put in them of ourselves, and so pictures of our family members and things that were important to us, perhaps, perhaps an important piece of jewelry or, you know, other things that might go into that box, and then we would talk about them and write about them. And then we asked them um, to take out the most important thing and say, imagine this was taken away from you and to write about that. And that immediately established, you know, a sense of empathy, I think, um, feeling of what a little bit of what it might feel to lose something very important to you, mm. and um, and that was how we started the um, the Holocaust Institute. So, don't you think there are answers in that to what you asked, like where where blogging would fit? I think so. Right? Yeah. Because there, there's a lot of personal reaction, but then you could then connect it to things, other things you're studying too. Right, right. Uh, Samantha, do you want to jump in with your thoughts about blogging? Or <laughs> thank you for joining us. We wanted to give you some <laughs> yeah. voice here. <laughs> Sorry. You've been in and out, but no, welcome. Okay. Um, I guess I've just been using blogs on Ning for hmm. a long time. I don't know, a few years, four hmm. or five years, and they're just that's, a, that's a very long time on the internet. <laughs> yeah, isn't it? Is. it? I mean, yeah. I've kind of been yeah. trying to get away from it because it's just within my my own classroom, and we're not connected to anybody, you know, outside of our walls. So, why is um, that? Are are they public or? There, no, I have it mm -hmm. so that it's not a public group. Mm -hmm. um, and part of that just started out with thinking that I would gradually, you know, once we got comfortable with it, make it more public, but that hasn't happened still so I need to push myself to get out there and I think I need to get away from Ning also I don't know so without, it's a matter of deciding I mean, what to without use without complaining or, or, or what, what, what like what what what's held you back do you think mm, I don't know you just can complain you can say whatever you want. <laughs> being afraid that it's not going to work out I guess you know just mm -hmm won't find people to comment or something will happen and it's inappropriate and then you have to deal with all of that. Mm -hmm. I didn't mean about going public, although th I was going to ask oh, that too. But that's okay. Ning? I just meant like, what, yeah, what's what's up with Ning for you? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, part of that is the public part of it. Um, we've got the discussion forums and I've kind of moved most of our the discussion forums that we do to um, Goodreads because most of what we would do on a discussion forum would be around a text, so um, mm -hmm. kind of my thought on that, I guess. And you're teaching English. English, yep. What grade? High school. High school. Um, twelve. So what, ten. What nine. do you imagine you'd like? What if you could do anything with blogging? What would you do? Oh, jeez. Oh. Um, I guess. In my perfect world, students are just mm. loving writing about whatever they're interested in, and then interacting with other young people, with their or anybody, I guess, um, mm -hmm. and just having a dialogue about whatever it is that they want to talk about. 
So, I, again, thoughts come and go. But what, one of the things um, that is important, and um, Valerie, I absolutely, I mean, we use Google Docs as our place, our, our preparation area. So there's absolutely a, a place for doing all of that, it seems, okay. um, before you publish. But um, what was I going to say? So while students are gathering their posts, they, they end up public commenting on Youth Voices on, on a, about four times before they post themselves. So, so the ratio of commenting to posting is is like that, and, and that's that is a requirement, kind of that the teachers have, done. and some teachers have even taken it further than that. And I think, come on, let your kids post, but <laughs> but 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 you know, the, but seeing seeing a comment as a, a genre, a, a piece of writing that that is developed and thoughtfully, you know, organized, and even um, includes some of your research um, to to support your thoughts in that comment, is a is a really a, Useful thing, and then and then because you see that you're making those comments, you kind of expect to get those back, and you end up getting them back um, because a lot of us are working that way in in this environment. So that's that's one thought. Um, I don't know if that helps or not, <laughs> but but, but okay, I, another issue that that keeps coming up, and and I, I wanted I I heard um, Samantha, I heard you said that. That you'd want to start with their interests, and that feels vital to me to blogging. I mean, it does. It, and I'm gonna. You know, I'll put out my opinion. You can disagree with it, but a lot of people, when they start blogging, see it as um, almost like I'm gonna ask really good questions, and kids are gonna respond to it. And and I think it's vital for blogging to be owned by students. Mm -hmm. um, that they're asking their own questions and exploring their own questions on the blog and um, and coming up with their their own answers and 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 it and it's coming out of their interests. Um, that's really what makes blogging happen, I think, and, and makes you care about responding to other people. So again, <laughs> two two quick examples that that maybe make some of this concrete is is when it when a young person starts a research project around an interest. We immediately have them find something on Youth Voices that is related to that, and they can almost find anything there at this point um, that is related. And so, they, even even if the kid wrote it, you know, three five years ago, they can connect with that student, and and, and they begin their research pro process by commenting on other people. Um, and then and then the first article they read, um, we we try to keep it quick and simple. Um, they publish immediately about that. So while they're reading more in-depth, you know, more complex articles and media, they're getting the feedback from other people. So, so always keeping in mind that kind of the commenting going on while you're also producing is what keeps it alive. I think. So those are some thoughts, and I don't know if that's helpful. But. Yeah. But also, I, please, I mean, if, if you guys are happy with whatever you're working on, you know, whatever platform, please do that. But Youth Voices would love to have some more. We don't have anybody from South Dakota right now. So <laughs> jump on Youth Voices. We'd love to have you um, so join us there. Um, and if I could <laughs> make one more pitch for why that's interesting is, is that... Um, you know, students when they develop interests don't necessarily find a a group of people in their own classroom that are also interested in that. But when you're putting it out in this more national forum, I mean, we're not that many. There are like a dozen schools from United from all the United States and about a dozen in New York City. Um, that, but it's more likely that you'll find somebody as odd and wonderful as you are. Um, and interested in it, with, with that larger audience. So that's that's kind of what we've thought about. So hmm. I think there you the go. question of audience that you were talking about is where my students are. And I read something where you were uh, one of your projects and getting kids um, blogging about their interests in 
inspired me to try something on a small scale. But it was more research writing, like they picked a topic that they were interested in, and it turned it's turning into, you know, copying things from other blogs or other sources. So some of their some of them do write about what they know. Like I had a girl who was doing raising chickens for a 4-H project, and her knowledge was based on her personal experiences and she was posting pictures and the process of raising these chickens but wow. then you know I have the student who's a twin I don't fan. have anybody in New York who does that <laughs> although I do I do I do run by uh, roosters in a parking lot in the South Bronx every day I guess. but anyway, sorry go ahead. <laughs> sure <laughs> sorry. you know but it was there was no deep question that she was mulling over um, it was something that was going on in her life currently and a lot of kids were um, interested in that because yes even though we are South Dakota there we have Mitchell where I teach is mostly town kids so they were fascinated that she mm -hmm. would choose to write about chickens <laughs> um, and, but it's and again just can you imagine what my seventh graders in the Bronx would think if, well, if there was that larger audience, so, yeah. Right. So mm -hmm. our blogs are public, um, mm -hmm. and I've tried to connect with other teachers, um, but right now, primarily the audience is um, my three classes, and so there's trying to break into. I did look at Youth Voices a few years ago, and I don't mm -hmm. recall the reason why. I don't know if our filter blocked it mm. at school. I'll have to revisit that though mm -hmm. and see if maybe we can That's try the idea that. and it's there's nothing about the technology really. It's really about community and and so you might find other communities too. But you know if you would have the chicken <laughs> writer <laughs> <laughs> there and and you could quickly email some of the rest of us on Youth Voices and say you know uh, we'd love to get some response that you know so but it, if it, if like our students are right there on Youth Voices already it's kind of right how it facilitates it easier but but that was the idea that I mean again almost the same time Michelle and all started <laughs> we we were starting Youth Voices and 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 out of some of these experiences of, of class blogs feeling isolated that what if we put all these class blogs on one yeah. thing and, and kind of connected with each other um, and you know it's not perfect there we still have to like I said it's not about the technology we still have to email each other and say did you see that one up but um, I wanted to get there the, just to mention, um, a, a young person, again, who's just been through the Youth Voices Project this summer, um, s said that what Youth Voices feels like to her, and this is sort of a curriculum issue, is, you know, the, this I believe, right, which is an assignment mm -hmm. many of us do. She said, mm -hmm. um, there, there's, uh, teachers have us do this assignment called This I Believe, and then other teachers have us do this, do research projects, right? And what feels, what happens on Youth Voices, she said, is that, that these two things come together. And, and that, it, when that can happen, I think it's really powerful. That, that this, I believe, isn't just, you know, my heart. It's also my heart, and it's the research I've done that supports that. And then the research, you know, is connected to something I really believe powerful. Um, so I think that's what blogging should be about, how, whatever platforms we're on. Well, I've been talking a lot. Other thoughts? Yeah, Michelle? <laughs> um, I wondered, um, do you find in their commenting that they will find themselves sometimes reacting strongly to a post and maybe going out and doing additional research to counter somebody's argument or point that they've made um, and sharing that you know, research? That'd be nice, but you know what? Oh, hey, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, that's exactly what happens all the time. <laughs> I live in a dream world. Okay. No, but you know what? You know what I would say though is that it doesn't necessarily happen with each individual post, and and because kids are posting, uh, you know, several times about the same topic, it happens over time, right? Um, and so that that's so I think it happens, but not necessarily with particular posts. 
is that what I would say? Um, which which gets to the assessment issue. Like when you the question that this all started with. Um, yeah. I always I always wonder about in a blogging process um, whether we want to assess individual comments, for example, or if we want to assess four comments about yeah. the same topic, right? So that so that it feels to me like the the assessment process should should look at a larger body of work. Um, like a portfolio. Yeah, sense. yeah, yeah, I mean, sure, that, that's one way of, yeah. Um, so that, so that, you know, yeah. Because <laughs> you do different things at different times and you want to, and, 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 and if we can, if we can get clear about what those criteria are, you don't have to do all those in that one comment, right? But you might do it over four comments or something. But that makes sense. We are over time, um, and and I appreciate you listening to me. I, <laughs> you you might notice that I'm a little passionate about all this. But uh, could well, could we <laughs> could we, we go around it. and <laughs> go around and hear some sort of final comments from each each of us? And um, Valerie, could we start at your end over there? We'll come back across. Okay. So what are you um, thinking now? Yeah. Um, we may focus more on Google Docs for the pre-writing revising aspect. Don't let us push you around uh, so much. Okay. Come on. No, it's okay. Um, so I will consider that aspect, but I just do think it's essential that the kids put it there in a small venue and have others look at it before they explode onto the World Wide Web. Um, you know, whatever I use. And, and the know. issue I think you're bringing up is, is where's the balance between connecting and crafting, right? Because um, I think connecting is real important. Right. And crafting is too, and, right. and you, you want to do a little of both. So. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Steve. Oh, we got a visitor. Who hey, is that, Steve? Steve? <laughs> he has to say hi now. Is this a daughter? I mean, your daughter was there earlier, right? Yeah. So that was, okay. I, um, and then Joseph, my youngest, and then this is Thomas. He's my seventh grader. And we were lucky enough to be in the same class all last year. So. Oh, wow. Um, he gets a break from me one year. But and then Who was lucky on that, years. Steve, by the way? Well, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. We were both very, very happy very nice. when the year was over. So. Um, <laughs> I, uh, these are the things that, that I've brought in tonight. Are, Go ahead, Steve. Are, uh, I definitely uh, want to look. I'm going to give it a shot, and I'm going to do, you know, um, I think it's a very valuable tool. One thing that struck me as we were talking towards the end was on evaluating and really um, maybe just looking at their posts or their, you know, how they respond and how they improve. And, for me, maybe using that more as an evaluation tool. Because at the first, it's maybe going to be, you know, more basic, sloppy, you know, text language, whatever. But then how it, to see them grow and develop and those types of things. Um, for me, it's just finding the platform that I want to use and and, uh, um, and going ahead with it. Cool. Samantha, any last thoughts? Um, hmm. Not necessarily. I don't know. <laughs> Not necessarily. I think I'm going to look at youth voices and maybe think about getting on there. So thank cool. you. Well, we'd love to have you. <laughs> thank you. Michelle. Um, I was just thinking about the digital writing sandbox and how the teachers are deciding on one of the technology environments we've explored um, or discussed and how they're then going to be developing lesson plans um, based on those technology environments or integrating them somehow and applying them this fall and mm -hmm. then we're going to share what that experience was like when, for, when we come back in January and I was just thinking about how exciting this is where you know at that point where they're putting together those lesson plans and and how they're thinking about what form of digital writing whether it's blogging or something else might enter into it so well, thank you I, and I, I did look I think there are are 60 teachers, is that right, involved? Um, yeah, we have, or? I'd say we, ha it's more, it's, a, I think we've got like 50, I want to say 52 maybe, and Close then we enough. have some, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we have facilitators who are assisting, 
but they're also part of the process, of course. And um, and during those chats, we always have a lead facilitator and an assistant facilitator, and um, and uh, they're all part of that conversation too. So yeah, all in total, we have over sixty people in the digital writing sandbox working together. Well, Michelle, thank you for doing this work for so many years. I, th I, you know, I, in the pre-show, we we talked about whether you do a MOOC or not, and and at least I think we can say that the MOOC people have learned from you and your work there and and others there in South Dakota. So, really well, I've been great. lucky enough to have people like Anne and Sammy and uh, Teresa yeah. Burnt and some um, other folks, um, Reva Potter, uh, Lindsay Sorensen, um, all helping in this endeavor. So. So we have a title for your book. It's called From Moo to Mook. Once you turn this into <laughs> anyway, yeah, I like and, it. <laughs> and any last thoughts? Um, like Sammy, I would like to revisit the idea of possibly uh, connecting through youth voices. And um, also the other thing that stood out for me is um, maybe assessing a larger body of work than necessarily post by post or um, I don't know this has been a great conversation so I've got a lot I've been taking notes <laughs> so good and that's a nice transition to say if you want to check this out again it will be up on YouTube right away it's like within a half an hour it goes up on YouTube and um, the um, eventually <laughs> I'm a little behind but um, it'll go out as a podcast at um, teacherstalkingteachers.org and at edtechtalk.com and the video will be up there too. Um, and um, all that network has been put together by Jeff Lebo and Dave Cormier um, at edtechtalk.com. Thank you all and we'll talk to you again soon. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Paul. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you, Paul, for this opportunity. Bye, so. Bye Valerie. Bye. <laughs>